Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to the Liberty Report. With us today is Daniel McAdams, our co-host. Daniel, good to see you. Good morning, Dr. Paul. How are you? Doing good. Doing, doing good. good. So, we want to talk a little bit about our military. You know, we talk about uh, you know the foreign policy of our government, which is a major, major problem. Yeah. But uh, what we're going to deal with today is more particular. Uh, checking up on the troops and how they've been treated and uh, what are their are their beliefs and do they affect policy and it looks like some of this modern stuff uh, social social engineering type of thing yeah. has entered even the air even the military so uh, the intercept has a real good article on this that we took a look at and uh, the title was the Pentagon plans to monitor social media of military personnel for extremist viewpoints. Yeah. Oh boy, that's uh, that's the thing about what, what. And I kept thinking, well, what would be extreme? Well, like uh, somebody defending the Constitution. <laughs> I remember a case. I think it was in the probably the, the 90s or so. You probably remember the case. There was a young soldier who um, uh, didn't want to put on a UN badge. Oh yeah. Yeah. And uh, stood up against. It. I think he got kicked out and yeah. probably got in a lot of trouble. But that was. That was a, a terrible thing, and that was a, an ex extremist view. And just, uh, you know, everybody, we take an oath of office, defend the Constitution and all, but we know uh, just from the experience in Washington, nobody either cares or understands it, but it's just, just words, words, words. But now they're looking into this, and I understand the Army's challenging the interpretation of their release, but they actually, uh, you know, uh, allowed us to know some of these plans but uh, the uh, the Pentagon if they start doing this and measuring the talents of our military I would say that it's not going to improve in any way uh, the ability of a soldier to be a better soldier maybe more obedient to the Constitution and and even a better soldier if they're involved in uh, uh, more challenges you you know there'll be challenges you know this guy just looked at a website uh, and uh, he he was uh, a look he was looking at Facebook too much so what what are we, what are we going to find out so the whole thing is just sort of snooping uh, yes you have to have discipline in the military yeah. and I know I understand all that I was there and uh, but I think this is one step further it represents the culture that we live in that we need to know about people because uh, we need to have uh, re the red laws on guns we need to study people and find those people who might commit a crime and I guess they're, they're going to be looking, I don't know whether they were ever specific in this, and say, this is what we're really looking for, and this is what we're going to weed out. Uh, if they are, I would say most of the things that they're going to find would probably be more subjective. Because if it's objective, it's not spying and, and finding out what you're looking at. It's what are you doing? Are you doing harm to people? And have you committed crimes? And military personnel have been known to commit crimes, especially when they get a little restless and stationed in foreign governments. <laughs> in foreign yeah. countries, that's when they're more likely to pr produce some problems. Well, the, the military has now since pushed back against the Intercept's report, and they've said, no, 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 no. But we'll get into what they said specifically, which makes me, when they say no, sometimes it means yes. But, you know, this isn't, Dr. Paul, this isn't about uh, some white soldier saying Sig Heil or, you know, beating up on black people. That already would be a huge problem. They would already get really, really in trouble <laughs> for doing it, and rightly so. This is about using algorithm, using artificial intelligence, and more importantly, hiring outside firms to get around First Amendment issues, hiring outside firms to try to get into the minds of soldiers. It's like pre-crime. They want to be able to get into the minds of these people before they do anything so they can weed them out. And the real question is, what are they actually looking for? Are they looking for people who secretly have a stash of Nazi memorabilia and worship Hitler, or are they looking for a political uh, type who they want to purge from the military? And you remember when the communists took over in the Soviet Union, they gave Trotsky the job of politicizing the army and turning it into the Red Army. And the Red Army wasn't the army that was loyal to protecting the country. You know, it was loyal to the Communist Party. Party. And so it makes you wonder, is the goal really to get rid of really bad actors and bad dudes, or is it to politicize and make the army and the military 
subservient to the Democratic Party and to the, as you would say, the cultural Marxists and the radical leftists. That's the big concern. And, and there's still one other possibility, but what you just said is, is, is a logical conclusion of what maybe is going on. But, you know, in studying this uh, vaccine stuff and the CDC, you know, on again, off again, confuse the people. I, I just don't think they're that dumb. And I think one of their goals has been to have chaos, yeah. you know, and, and they certainly do that to, to get people all confused and, and divisive and, and citizen against citizen. But in, in a way, this, this produces the same, the same thing. They, uh, they all of a sudden start talking about this and people say, hey, we've already reacted to it. Well, what are they doing this for? You know, and all of a sudden, and, and then, then as, soon, as soon as it looks like, oh, they've been caught at it, they really are doing it and they're in denial, that, that stirs up this, uh, this chaos and, and disruption. And if you're looking for things to uh, make an army less efficient, yeah. I would say that's a possibility. There are other things they've been doing with the military, you know, some of the affirmative action things that they all do. And I would think this would make it worse, but maybe there are some people that think that's a very good idea. And, and, uh, and this is a reflection. Yeah. Well, the, um, you may remember uh, Mike German, we used to work with him when, when I was working for you on the Hill. He was with the ACLU at the time really good guy he was former fbi and he was he he was really part of this broad coalition that we had for civil liberties uh, but he he chimes in on the intercepts article and he says using keywords to monitor social media isn't just an unnecessary privacy invasion it's a flawed strategy that will ensure it's short-lived so <laughs> he's saying this is a really dumb boneheaded move and it is but here's one of the th that the the intercept mentioned in the piece one of the firms i guess it's about to get the contract to start snooping around. It's called Babel Street, is a company. Their stock in trade is buying up bulk cellular location data of Americans and selling it to national security agencies like the FBI and the NSA so that they can get around the problems of trying to get a warrant to spy on people. So they already are, I would say, a pseudo government agency gathering our data and selling it to the government, basically getting rich off of spying on us uh, for the government, which is bad news. But here's the, here's the part, here's John Kirby, he's a Pentagon spokesman, he's back, he was there with Obama, and he said, this is misreporting, this is from Military Times today. And this is the way he says it though, he's a, he's a slimy guy. He says, quote, I am not aware of such a contract with such a company. Okay, well that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. <laughs> and he also says, quote, there is no pilot project being run. Well, the reporting, if you look at it, wasn't that it's being run, it said it was being planned. So I would say that Kirby, my guess is he's weaseling his words around. He, he didn't tell a lie. Yeah. <laughs> so he feels better about this. So, um, you know, I, I wanted to go on another thing dealing with troops, unless you have another point there. I just had one there. other thing about that that I wanted to point out, Dr. Paul, because this is a, 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 what's happening in the military. And I do think it's a very sort of Trotskyist thing, and it also happened in communist China. Uh, they've started this countering extremism working group, and that is basically to ferret out extremists, quote unquote, from the military, and they're kicking out a lot of people. Well, the person in charge of this, his name is Bishop Garrison, and if you want to put someone in charge of countering extremism, he would not be my first choice. Let's look at a couple of his tweets. This is the kind of guy that we're going to put in the military to get rid of extremism. Let's put that first clip up if we can. Here he is. He's got a Black Lives Matter thing. He says, the latest truth from so-and-so, the deafening silence of veteran service organizations on Black Lives Matter. So, hey, you know, that's, it's, 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 Black Lives Matter is a radical Marxist group, self-admittedly so. It doesn't mean you, you don't like black people if you don't like Marxist groups. And here's the next one uh, from Bishop Garrison. Let's do that next clip. Silence, this is about Trump. Silence from our congressional leaders is complicity. He, meaning Trump, is only going to get worse from here, and his party and its leadership are watching it happen while doing nothing to stop it. Support for him, i.e. Trump, is racist, is support for all his beliefs. So here's a guy who publicly tweets, anyone who supports Trump is a racist. And so this is the guy you have in the Pentagon ferreting out racists. I think it's a Trotsky move. Yeah, and in some ways, though, I'll go back to um, the, the, the motivation. 
uh, I don't believe that they're going to achieve uh, uh, winning more converts to, to their position. That somebody sees this and say, "Oh yeah, I guess they're I guess they're right. I, I missed it. I didn't I didn't know that Trump was really this horrible racist." Yeah. Now I believe him because I've heard it. Yeah. It's going to do this. Yeah. It's, it's going to drive those wedges in there. Civil war. Yeah, yeah. and that's it. Bad news. So, Sorry. Now we can. No, that's, uh, that's okay. Good. Point. But it's another military story. The second one, it's similar, <laughs> similar vein. Yeah, it's it's uh, you know we train our soldiers. Uh, supposedly, I thought, you know, uh, to defend our country, <laughs> you know, if we're, if we're attacked, not to go uh, looking for monster to destroy. And uh, if you have, uh, it's, uh, it's also the Constitution provides a, uh, a, a purpose of defending, uh, defending ourselves domestically from uh, uh, certain types of, of violence. But um, we have found out that uh, uh, the troops are being used, and, and they may need a special training for this. This is yeah. this is a uh, this is not uh, you know how do you uh, stop an invasion of uh, of military tanks and weaponry and bombs coming? No, this this is to get the people, get the soldiers to know how to act uh, and, and make sure he's not, they don't aggravate anybody. But they're part of the group that uh, have been uh, known to go to bars now, and, and their job is to go to bars and uh, get get people registered, or I mean, get them, uh, get them uh, vaccinated. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and it, the, one, the one ad that was on TV or something that we saw, it was so Oh, this you know, the person was just so pleased to yeah. participate in it. it was such such a such propaganda. So uh, that's a that's a different role, you, you know, for the for the for the government or for the military. But it's those uh, those kind of things that uh, uh, might uh, uh, say that uh, uh, they're designed really to make us weaker, yeah. <laughs> not not stronger. I mean. Uh, uh, I, uh, we, we, we don't need and we could prevent the need uh, for, uh, you know, militarism and military fighting by a different policy. But then again, they have policies that are liable to make, put our troops in harm way. And uh, it's this, this kind of stuff that would weaken and confuse the, the military. And, uh, but they're gonna get confused anyway about it because uh, it's, it's such a challenge, but it's also going to end up with conflict, even in the military, there has to be some of this stuff that they put onto the soldiers. You know, there's going to be, you know, this genderism and things. I know there's going to be factions in the military yeah. that are going to like it. So uh, uh, this is is this is not uh, exactly the way you. If your if your goal is to build an efficient uh, army, well versed in defending our country, it's not doing that. Well, the problem they have is that they have a huge surplus of this vaccine because nobody wants to get the jab. <laughs> tons and tons of it to try to export. Try they don't know what to do. So the Dallas County Health and Human Services had a brilliant idea. A light bulb went off in their heads. Let's go around to bars, to convenience stores where young people hang out. And hey, here's an idea. Let's bring uniformed soldiers from the National Guard along with us. Take them around. Let's put that first clip up. Take them around to bars, armed with jabs in each arm. Bam, bam, here you go, get your jab. Let's look at this first one. Here's Dallas County HHS. We're going out tonight to administer the COVID-19 shot to bar goers in Deep Ellum. By getting vaccinated, you'll be able to enjoy going out again, knowing that you're safe and protected. You know, okay, but look at what they're doing. And, and Zero Hedge had a great take on it. And, and this is the problem, Dr. Paul. Let's put up that next link. I'm just gonna read what they had to say. If we can put that next clip up because this is a very good point. And here you see a soldier in a convenience store. The guy's probably going in to get himself a beer or something. And here comes a soldier with a shot in his hand. It says U.S. Army on his, uh, on his coat. And this is what uh, Zero Head says about it, Dr. Paul. For when a vaccine crew of literal uniformed soldiers randomly walks up to citizens saying they, quote, need to get vaxxed, do the individuals understand it's entirely an option and not an authoritative mandate? And would, in the example of the video, a recent immigrant to the country or even new American citizen understand the net nature of the encounter? And that's a very good question, I think. Right. You know, there was a, a big debate, I believe it was after the Civil War, the, the debate was whether or not you can have the military running running the show and uh, ha having, uh, you know, mil militarism. Uh, 
domestically, and they, and they had passed this bill called Posse Comitatus. Yeah. And I was thinking, maybe they ought to call it up and, and redo it. <laughs> it's, it's say that they shouldn't be in this war against the American people by participating in forced vaccination. You say, well, they didn't force this guy. Yeah, but I would say, you know, if your boss can intimidate you, you don't want the shot, but the boss says you, you're going to get the shot or you lose your job, yeah. uh, people take the shot. You, so you can imagine if the, if the military shows up, you, you're going to have a shot, aren't you? <laughs> you know. And the implication so, is that it's patriotic. Your soldiers here, do you hate America? You're going to refuse a soldier? Right. It's, pretty, it's pretty insidious, I think. Right. Well, let's move on to, I think, the kookiest. I, 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 it's, it's really, it's a tough one, but I think this is the kookiest mayor in the country, um, uh, if, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe, maybe we can find someone kookier. But let's put on this next clip, and I'll throw it over to you, Dr. Paul, when everyone has a look at uh, Mayor Kook. Chicago <laughs> Mayor Lori Lightfoot. You know, when I see this in another story, and most people know about her, and all they have to do is watch her on television, the, th the first question that comes to me and to a lot of others, how did she get to be mayor of one of our biggest cities in the country? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and yet the uh, possibility is that uh, even with all the silliness going on, if there were, and, and the, the, the wreck that, that Chicago is in, it, uh, she's the kind of person that would defund the police, restrain the police and, in, in the midst of rioting, and then everything gets worse, and there's a lot more killing, and the killing is uh, that of uh, mostly minorities are being killed. Yeah. Well, the majority of the minorities are being killed. And, and she does this, and people would probably re-elect re her. And, uh, but she, I, I think maybe she's overstepped her bounds now because, uh, well, let's hope, I, I guess we can't be optimistic. Uh, but she, uh, she, she said that uh, we shouldn't, they, the, um, oh, oh. <laughs> I said they, <laughs> mayors like her yes. they are, are saying that, uh, that, that, that uh, she, she's not gonna talk to white reporters and uh, uh, she's never going to respond to them. And, you know, I imagine, I wonder if, if, if there's anybody out there that thinks, well, could that be racist? Yeah. <laughs> could that be racist that they're, they're not going to ever, ever talk to some, somebody? And she was very specific on the people she didn't like. She didn't like white people. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's, a, it's a mess, and uh, I, it'll be interesting to see what happens because, because, you know, on one side, we see some mayors and some governors losing their credibility and that's a good sign but uh so far you think these cities are so embedded and they've drifted this way for uh you know maybe 50 60 70 years where it became a a, a socialist state and they always depend on federal money so i tell you what uh, you know uh if we had the authority in washington I, I wouldn't say to send in the troops and clean up that mess. I would say quit sending money. Yeah. Quit stealing the money from Texas and sending it into Chicago and feeding this group, you know, and let, let them work it out. Maybe they would come up with uh, a different system of government if they, if they see that they can't afford uh, a runaway welfareism. Yeah. Well, here's the reality of Chicago. And I'm just as we are talking, I just looked it up out of curiosity, ABC Chicago headline. 18 hours ago, Chicago shootings, 108 children shot, 16 dead so far this year, oh, police say. So that's the reality of Chicago. And let's put that picture of Lightfoot back up. That's the reality. And here's what Lightfoot is obsessed about. Rather than the 100 kids getting shot, let's put that uh, uh, Mayor Lightfoot's picture back up. Rather than 100 kids getting shot, Chicago mayor reaches her two-year midway point. As mayor, her spokeswoman says she's granting one-on-one -on -one interviews only to black or brown journalists. So meanwhile, black and brown people are getting blown up, shot, killed, kids, and she's saying, I'm not going to talk to you. So I don't know. You're right. I mean, would they reelect someone like this? It would be kind of <laughs> sad if they did. But she sort of uh, fits example that I talk about, and that is my experience in Washington is those individuals, and they were well known, uh, shouted racism, racist all the time. Yeah. And uh, they were very anxious to paint everybody else. You know, like, like now, didn't we just read something that said uh, that Trump is, uh, you know, a horrible, horrible racist, you know, and that goes on and on. But my argument has always been the people I knew in Washington, the people who shouted the loudest and the most frequent uh, uh, 
uh, epithets against another person, say racist, 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 they themselves were the most racist. So I would say that her charges, uh, I think she qualifies. It's not like we're making this up, but I think most people would uh, would say this is this is racist what they're dealing with. Yeah. And I I think a few people have jumped the uh, you know the line and went over and, and started criticizing her. But you know how long can it go on? And that's why I have to say well. Uh, you, you, in order to satisfy yourself on why, once again, create the chaos, disruption of the street, you know, we want disruption. And, you know, they want economic and social injustice. That's the way cultural Marxism works. Yeah. And uh, she may be a hero among uh, the, the Marxists. Yeah, yeah, group. she may be. Well, should we move on to, to Cruz or? Oh, yes. This is my uh, nomination for Dummy of the Week. <laughs> <laughs> Let's put up this next picture. We saw this this morning. Ted Cruz, four months into it, Biden is crawling in bed with Putin in Russia. So here's Ted Cruz, Republican from Texas. What a shame, what a disgrace. But basically what he's doing is he is adopting the Russia gate, the Russia scenario that the Democrats misused and abused for the entirety of Trump's uh, presidency. He's saying, well, it wasn't them, it was you guys. You guys are in, in bed with, with Putin. You guys are in bed with Russia. It's taking the same ridiculous conspiracy theory and repackaging it and throwing it at the Democrats, and it's just awful. Of course, he said this was just the fact that they haven't followed Trump's American first policy, yeah. you know, and that would solve all the problems. I got to think, well, yeah, uh, well, America first uh, isn't the worst term in the world if you if you define it properly. Yeah, properly maybe yeah. maybe America first means mind our own business, yeah. you know, and 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 work with people and trade with people, and that might serve our interests the most. So, uh, and he's arguing that we need more of this American first stuff. But what he wants, he wants, he, he says he's the champion of American first. But I think he's the champion of empire first. You know, whatever fits the empire. And then he gets into this whole argument about the pipelines. You know, they, they uh, Biden closes one down now and then he urges another one, uh, you know, Nord Stream. And, and, and he, he's right in, in saying that. But, but the problem is, is why are we involved at all? Why, why should we be deciding who, who, who builds a pipeline from Russia to Germany? Yeah. Uh, you know, that's a, that to me would be uh, may, maybe a, a move toward peace. Yeah. You know, because uh, your Eastern Europeans, Europeans would be more dependent on Russia and maybe they'd be less likely to bomb each other. But we can't stand the idea that... Uh, that they're they're working with our allies and our allies and this is what he inferred our allies shouldn't have this privilege of deciding whether it's it's good for them or yeah. not it's, it is really crazy if, if people want to get find something and get upset and that's not hard to find something this little, little argue uh, article uh, just is is so annoying because it's uh, because he represents a significant group. He's getting more popular, not less popular, you know, be, because he's an American first, strong military, uh, now gets along with Trump and all this sort of stuff. Supposedly, so he, yeah. uh, but, but, but uh, if you look at him uh, from a good foreign policy standpoint or the Constitution, I, I, I think uh, he's nowhere close. I, I think he's just the worst kind of neocon, the worst kind of neocon. It makes me think we need another Senator Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Who's better than one? Uh, but no, it's an embarrassment to have him in Texas. As you point out, first of all, he flat out blames Russia for the colonial pipeline supposed hack, which is ridiculous because even uh, the, the intelligence agency said they have no evidence that it was uh, the Russian government who did it. And then, as you say, he criticizes Biden for doing something semi-sensible, which is saying, OK, we're going to stop standing in the way of the Nord, uh, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which, as you say, brings in the gas from Russia to Europe, to Germany, to Europe. Uh, and that means that they're going to get the gas cheaper, they're going to get it easier, they're going to have no problems. I guess what he wants is for the Germans and for the East Europeans to have to buy gas from America on a ship sent all the way over the ocean at two or three times the price. And I guess that's America first. But you're right. Uh, you know, uh, saying that somehow it's, it's, it's absurd for Russia to sell its gas to Europe. It's just insane, you know, it's just yeah, insane. It's, that's uh, economic planning for the special privileges of our close friends yeah. and that's, that's a, a club. I want to do want to talk a little bit more about the, the Keystone because uh, from our viewpoint, 
you, you know, when, when we're talking about Nord Stream, uh, I think a lot of people can visualize this that we just e explain, you know, why are we over there? Why can't, we, why can't they decide where the pipeline should be? And just leaving alone, I think it's going to make, uh, make sense to a lot of people. But if you use that same argument uh, for Keystone, you say, uh, no, the federal government has to get out of it and uh, somebody else has to deal with it. It's a little more complex than that because uh, uh, we've drifted into a situation which is a is a mess there. Why should a president have this much power? <laughs> it has nothing to do with the free market. Matter of fact, uh, the, the one thing that if you wanted to really solve that problem, you'd have to recognize, uh, you know, the, the principle of eminent domain is not a freedom principle. Uh, and, and that's that's a, that's difficult. But the the other thing is, is, you know, states should have more prerogatives uh, on, on what they do. Uh, it should be done in, in privacy, but you'd have to you'd have to deal with eminent domain if you want it to be privately uh, owned. But, uh, you, you know, uh, I think that uh, th this whole thing that becomes a federal issue, only a federal issue, it really bugs me to think that the president come in the first day, writes a thing and yeah. it's closed down. Close it down. And, uh, and, you know, maybe when you've dug a hole this deep and it's the wrong place you would dig the hole do you have to just fill it in with dynamite <laughs> or maybe maybe you can salvage something from all the mistakes they may know just turn it off so it's it, uh, not very good that's why non-intervention from the very beginning is best and it's also the fairest thing that we can do it also fits into the Constitution pretty well pretty well yeah well I'm gonna close with one little thing and it's an update on our favorite congressman our favorite House of Representatives member Thomas Messy. Remember, he got into a little bit of trouble because he got a group together and they decided to go down there on the floor without their masks on. And they stood there and they chatted and chatted and chatted. Uh, well, he got a letter from Pelosi's people yesterday. They're not happy at all. And he said he's going to file that letter away properly. Let's look at this last clip. Here it is, Thomas Massey. I just filed House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's <laughs> letter warning me to follow her mask rule. And for those of you listening, it's in the trash can. Now, here's what the letter says. It just says, uh, this letter is to inform you that a further violation of House Resolution 38 will resign in a f result in a $500 fine. The next violation will be $2,500 fine. I'm glad to see, Dr. Paul, that's, that uh, Congressman Massey has properly filed that warning. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. You know, it, the thought that came to me was, I wonder when the rules permitted this. You know, I, I guess the uh, House uh, Pelosi types, they can pass rules like this, yeah. and, uh, and that's the way it's been established. But I wonder if that was ever done in the early years. So uh, someday I'll probably try to get somebody to figure that out because it, it's ridiculous. Yeah. You know, if you don't do what Pelosi tells you, don't sit here, don't sit here. <laughs> <laughs> it's just pretty foolish. Yeah. So. Well, I'm done with that. I just All want right. to lighthearted ending. And uh, <laughs> I want to thank our viewers today for tuning in. It's been great having our viewers as often we do. And I think uh, today we uh, did uh, a little bit, we review, uh, you know, discussed a little bit both on foreign policy and domestic policy. But uh, we have had some really good responses on interest in uh, both. Right now, the foreign policy is stirring up. The Middle East is a time bomb. At the same time, uh, the finances is, are, are getting bad. Uh, the uh, the uh, whole thing about the deficits are being excluded and inflation has stirred its ugly head. So there's a lot going on. And just like I have said so many times, the problems are not uh, dropping out of the sky. Sometimes we do get problems out of the sky, uh, but mo mo most of the time, the problems that we really have to deal with are, uh, are, are designed by people in government. And uh, I think the inclination for people to create these problems on their own, like I have always argued the case, the 18 to 21 year olds don't go out and start war. It's somebody else that does it. It's the governments that do it. It's a bad policy, bad economic theory, a bad monetary policy. And uh, this is where the problem is. But uh, I am always uh, I made a bit op more optimistic when I meet a lot of young people really serious about it. And when we have good information and good news, we like to report it too. Because that's something, to tell you the truth, we don't have a whole lot of else.
because we can't use the tools of force, which is the temptation that so many people use. We have to do it through providing information, trying to persuade people with the ideas of liberty that they're much more superior to the ideas of authoritarianism. I want to thank everybody for tuning in today to the Liberty Report. Please come back soon.